Did y'all know he's alive? Amen. Hallelujah. What a great joy it is to know that our Lord and Savior lives, and because he lives, we'll live also. What a great blessing we had this morning up on the hill as uh, we uh, just entered into the new sunrise service this morning. Uh, just perfect. I tell you, the weather was great. Music was great. Uh, uh, it was just an awesome time as uh, Brother Ricky was ministering there. The sun was just rising up over the people right there. It was just a glorious, glorious time in the Lord. We appreciate all that came. I think we had about uh, maybe 40 or 50 people yep. up there on the hill. So that was a great, uh, great turnout for uh, an early morning service right there. The girl said it's early. Y'all have to bear with us. Uh, that's exactly what Mary said. It's early. <laughs> it's early. <laughs> but it, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be able to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. What a great God we have. This morning, I'd like for all of you to stand with us. I'd like to welcome those that are online with us this morning. We're going to sing this old song. It's called Gone. Miss uh, Sandra was just playing it right there. Right there. Mary came to that tomb, and the tomb was empty. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let's sing this song together. Let's
number 73, guys. Oh, no. 78. 78. Excuse me. <coughs> number 78. Is that thing going to buzz? <laughs> <laughs> my soul and 
a grave that tried to hide his precious blood that gave me life but in three days he breathed for him he rose to stand in my defense so
I'm saved. I'm glad to be able to be up here, standing up here. But, uh, I love my Lord, and uh, He's done so much for me. And, uh, I enjoyed that service this morning. It was, uh, it was. I was noticed those airplanes. It was uh, flying across. I seen one go across, and I was hoping another one to come across. And that that was that would have been a symbol right there. Boy, he was looking down on us, but I was looking up to him. And I always do, but I know my Savior's alive. He ain't dead. He ain't dead. And I don't what people say, that they don't believe in Jesus. But I do. I do. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. I hope I can make it through this. If I can't, maybe the choir can help me out. We get to the chorus. We want all of us to <laughs> come and sing it this morning. Once I went walking down a long and lonely road, I thought I had no one who would share my heavy load. Then my mind went soaring back to a place I've never been. And I realized I was standing at the foot of my king. There were three lonely crosses on a hillside that day. As I looked at my Savior, I cried, Lord. There was blood flowing down as thorns pierced his head. And he cried, Father, forgive. And then my Savior was dead. Well, I stood there in silence, thinking, Lord, how can this be? Oh, it won 
Well, I'm so not like y'all, but I'm so thankful to be able to uh, worship with you guys in the house of the Lord in this special Resurrection Day because He deserves all our honor. And, um, we would not be here if it weren't for Him. Um, we would be lost in the hell, basically. Um, <coughs> I'm going to read one verse. It's uh, John 19, verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The acapella. <laughs> Awkward silence. <laughs> it's been a beautiful day, though. It, we couldn't have asked for a better day to be up on that hill, and if you missed it, you really missed it. on the road to Jerusalem the time had come to sacrifice again my two small sons they walked beside me on the road the reason that we came was to watch the lamb Daddy, Daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand. So I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said to children, watch the land. There will be so many in Jerusalem today. We must be sure the Lamb doesn't run away. And I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said, Dear children, watch the Lamb. When we reached the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers, no joyful worship songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men. Then I heard the crowd cry out, tried to leave the city but we could not get away forced to play in this drama a part I wished I didn't have to play why upon this day were men condemned to die why were we standing here where soon they would come by I looked and said, even now they come. The first one cried for mercy. The people gave him none. The second one was violent. He was arrogant and loud. I can still hear his angry voice screaming at the crowd. 
Did someone say there's Jesus? I scarce believe my eyes. A man so badly beaten, he barely looked alive. Blood poured from his body, from the thorns upon his brow. Running down the cross and falling to the ground. I watched him as he struggled. I watched him as he fell. The cross came down upon his back. The crowd began to yell. In that moment, I felt such agony. In that moment, I felt such loss. Until I heard a Roman soldier grab my arm and scream, carry his cross. At first I tried to resist him, then his hands reached for his sword. And so I knelt and took the cross from the Lord I placed it on my shoulder we started down the street the blood that he'd been shedding was running down my cheek they led us to Golgotha they drove nails deep in his feet and hands yet upon the cross I heard him pray Father, forgive them. Oh, never have I seen such love in any other eyes. Into my hands fit my spirit. He prayed, and then he died. I stood for what seemed like years. I'd lost all sense of time. Until I felt two tiny hands holding tight to mine. My children stood there weeping. I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us. The lamb ran away. Daddy, Daddy, what have we seen here? There's so much that we don't understand. So I took them in my arms. We turned and faced the cross. Then I said to children, watch the land. Good morning. Got a couple announcements. Remember our upcoming uh, vacation Bible school in June. And if anyone is still interested in helping, need to see either Bailey, Misty, or Mama. And uh, remember, May 7th at 6 p.m. is the mother and daughter banquet. So if uh, you just still need a head count, whoever plans to attend for a far of the catering. Okay. Anything else? Remember, no children's church this morning will all be upstairs in the sanctuary. Okay. Any birthdays this week? Got one. Anybody else? Okay. Happy birthday.
Because uh, if it wasn't for his uh, death, burial, and resurrection, none of this would be even possible. Glenn, you pray for us. morning here at Good News. Appreciate you uh, making Good News your place of worship here on your Easter Sunday. If you're joining us online, as Brother Donald's already mentioned, we thank you for letting us be where you are. I uh, used to have a lady that attended church and she told me, she'd said, you use way too much scripture. Well, I can tell you she would be so upset with me this morning. I'd like for you to turn, if you will, to John's Gospel, chapter number 14. If you will turn there, John's Gospel chapter number 14, and uh, we haven't really been preaching a series, but we've been staying focused on the Resurrection Day and Resurrection Sunday as we have uh, kind of built up to this time. Uh, as it's already been mentioned, what a blessed sunrise service we had today. Brother Ricky Elrod, the Lord used him, did a good job of keeping us, bringing us into perspective of who we are, uh, who Christ is, and what we have in Him. And today, I'd like for us to think about this particular topic today, Resurrection Day. Resurrection Day. Good to look around this sanctuary and see people we hadn't seen in a while. And may I say, too, uh, that the, uh, uh, the uh, mother and daughter conference, that was not conference, but uh, uh, that was mentioned is for all the ladies. Isn't that right? So it's, uh, ladies, you just, you come to that whether you've got uh, children or not. Be for all the ladies. So you may have a mother and a son. Don't bring him, but you come. Amen. And so, uh, yeah, so that's for all the ladies, that mother and daughter banquet. So you keep that 
in mind. And so I'd like to talk to you a few minutes today about Resurrection Day. A lot of things happened on Resurrection Day that you and I uh, don't think about too much. I want to encourage you to study this for yourself. Don't just take my word for it. I hope to whet your appetite a little bit. Uh, if you're here, you're watching, and really all you want to know about Jesus is how to get forgiveness right before you die, then uh, today I'm, I'm about to share way more information about Jesus than you ever really wanted. Uh, but we want to talk about him for a few minutes today, focus on him, uh, what was done during Resurrection Day, the day of resurrection. Uh, it wasn't that he just got out of the tomb, said, go eat some lunch, everything's done, you know, uh, hide some eggs, that kind of thing. No, nothing wrong with those things. I'm not being critical of those things, but there was much more to it than that. As a matter of fact, all throughout your Bible, uh, your Bible reflects this very day of celebration, Resurrection Day. The Bible said in Genesis that the ark landed on the mountains of Ararat the seventh month and the fourteenth day. The scripture said when um, the children of Israel were Egyptians, when they were in bondage to Egypt and they were Egyptian slaves, uh, that Moses was commanded for them to take them a lamb and for them to, to examine that lamb and for them to kill that lamb on the seventh month and the fourteenth day and spread the blood over the doorpost. In Leviticus chapter number 17, or 16, rather, uh, the Bible said that Aaron, as the priest, was to take the blood into the holiest of holies on the seventh month and the fourteenth day. Christ was crucified during the season of Passover, the seventh month, the fourteenth day. And then the fourteenth day, there was crucifixion on the fourteenth and the fifteenth and the sixteenth. The seventeenth was Sunday. He rose again. And so that's why that's significant. And all throughout your Bible, uh, you see this pattern. And so today we want to look at a passage to get us started in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 12. And Nathan will show that to us. And by the way, we certainly do appreciate Brother Nathan. He'll keep you from uh, having to thumb through your Bible a good little bit today as he will uh, run these uh, uh, verses over the screens. But in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12, notice what the Bible said, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place. Now that holy place he's talking about uh, was not in the temple uh, because the scripture said when he, as Ms. Sheila mentioned a while ago, when he said it is finished, that the veil of the temple, this thick covering of the holies of holies that separated the inner temple from the inner sanctum where the Ark of the Covenant would be, that thick veil that was uh, impenetrable, really. I mean, it was, it was uh, uh, constructed and made in such a way that it could not be ripped in two. But the Bible said, when Christ said, it is finished, that that veil was supernaturally torn in two, uh, giving you and I a symbolism of now uh, everyone, there's no more separation between man and God, everyone now, not just the priests, can come into the holies of holies. It's not that place that he's talking about here, but he's talking about that very presence of God the Father himself. Notice the scripture said he entered at once into the holy place, right into the Father's presence, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Well, when did he do that? He did not do that when he ascended in Acts chapter 1 verse 9. That's not when he did it. As a matter of fact, you and I will read descriptions here in 14, 6, 15, and 16 that don't even describe that time. So when did he actually do that? If you will, look at John 14, 1, if you will, just for a moment. I want to go down to verse number 6, and I want you to keep in, con in mind this morning the context of this scripture. Can I say to you today, I want you to know this scripture does apply to us. Yes, if we believe in Christ like we believe in God, our heart don't need to be troubled. Yes, it applies to us, but I want to encourage you today to keep the context of this scripture. What is the context of this scripture? He's talking to his disciples. When is he talking to his disciples? The very night before he goes to the garden after, listen, he's already established 
established the Lord's Supper. And so now he's having a conversation with his disciples. They are making their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He will be praying there in John chapter number 17. He will be arrested there in John chapter number 18. He will be taken from there in John chapter number 19 into the high priest's palace for his trial. And so what's happening now? He's preparing these disciples that hasn't got it so far, that hasn't listened so far. He's preparing them for what's about to happen. Keep that in mind. If you will, just if you just wrap your mind around this this morning. He's talking not to you and me. These, these scriptures apply to you and me. Now don't, don't get me wrong, they do. But he's not talking to you and me. He's talking to the disciples. That's who he's talking to. So they have given up their homes, their jobs. They have put everything, Easter, hey, they put all their eggs in his basket. They have put everything, listen, in his hands. They are following him. They have a misguided notion. You'll see him mention it again in Acts chapter 1. After all of this, after he's been on earth 40 days after his resurrection, you'll see him asking him, will you now... Restore the kingdom to Israel. Uh, they, they, that's been their whole thing the whole time. They have missed his mission of mercy. And isn't it good, listen, that every resurrected person that had anything to say in your Bible came, listen, they came back with a, listen, with a message of mercy. That's wonderful. You remember Jonah? Christ said about Jonah himself, said the only sign I'm going to give you is the sign of Jonah. This you can reflect and liken unto me, but you remember Jonah? When Jonah was first sent to Nineveh, when God moved on his heart to go to Nineveh, what did Jonah want to do? He wanted to curse them. That's what he wanted to do. He didn't want to see them saved. He didn't want their city helped. He wanted to see them dead. And he was a patriot of Israel. He despised uh, the Assyrians. He didn't want to see anything good happen to those Assyrians. But when he went down into that belly of hell, as he called it, when he went down into that fish's belly and was there in the bottom of the Mediterranean, and when he finally got spit out on that shore over there, what was his message? His message was a message of mercy. He came back from resurrection, if you will. His message was a message. He said, 40 days and, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The message he'd rather have preached to him was, Nineveh's going to be overthrown. Y'all are done. Y'all are dead. That wasn't his message. It was a message of resurrection. When Christ came from the grave, his message was a message of resurrection. And I want you to notice, he's telling these disciples, read it for yourself there, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Okay, now this is something they haven't done with their whole heart as of yet. You might say, well, why not? Why do you say that? Because they still haven't got it. That's what he's doing with this. In my father's house are many mansions. If you will, the, the Hebrew word used for a bridal chamber. The best a father's house would have to offer those type dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now we, when is he going to prepare a place for them? You've got to keep in mind that before the cross, nobody, nobody had a relationship of salvation with God the Father. Do you hear me? Before the cross, that was not possible. They trusted God. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. There was people all down through the days of the law, all down through Abraham's day. There were people that trusted God. I told you, I'm going to give you way more information than you want if you don't want to hear nothing about Christ. But listen, they trusted him. And friend, they went to a place called paradise or a place called Abraham's bosom. But they too had to hear the message of grace. They looked forward to the cross. You and I look backward. And so they had to hear the message of grace before they could go into the presence of God the Father. They are no longer in Abraham's bosom. They are no longer in paradise. It has been, if you will, it has been moved to that place of God's very presence. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But we got to get to it first. And so... Nobody, my, listen, don't let me belabor this. Nobody had a relationship. In other words, without Christ making a place for them or preparing a place for them, they could not go to where he was going. They could not go to the presence of the Father. It was impossible. 
Their sins had not been remitted. What does that word remit mean? Cancel. And they had not been remitted yet. He had not gone to the cross yet. And so it was not possible for them to go. But you'll notice what else he said. He said, I'm going to prepare this place. Has he gone to prepare a place for you and me? Yes, he has, just like he did them. But he said, I'm going to prepare this place. And he said, I'm going to do it in verse number 3, that where I am, he said, you can come. You can be there also. As of this very moment in the life of Christ, they could not be there also. (laughs) No. But he was going to make that possible. And notice verse 4. I won't read all of this to you because of the time. Listen. Notice verse 4. What does verse 4 mean exactly? I just got through telling you they they weren't getting this. I just got through telling you most of what he was telling them was going over their heads. They were not taking it to heart. They were not thinking about it. Just got through telling you that. So why did he make a statement like this? These were good Jewish men. These men knew about the Passover. These men knew about the sacrificial system. These men knew what... Leviticus chapter 16 said about the about the blood and the mercy seat. These men knew about the scapegoat. These men knew what Leviticus chapter number 14 said about cleansing a leper, about the dirty bird. They knew what all of that was about. They knew all of that stuff. So they should understand what's taking place here. After all, did they not hear John the Baptist himself say, Behold the Lamb of God that does what? Takes away the sin of the world. Had they not heard that? To relate Christ as a lamb? A lamb what? Slain before the foundation or before the world ever got started? Before anybody was ever born? Before anything ever happened? I mean, could they not relate this? It's pretty simple. But could they not do it? I'm not trying to say I'm smarter than the apostles. I would have probably been in the same boat, maybe even worse. I'd have been worse. I'm not Jewish. And so he's telling them, you should know this. So you'll notice Thomas just goes ahead and makes it plain here. They don't know. Notice Jesus, what he said in verse 6, back to what John the Baptist said about him being the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Notice he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man or no one cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, they can't nobody else do this but me. I'm the only one can do this. Peter has already confessed in John chapter number 6 that you are the lamb. He said, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. We know this. Can't nobody else. They said it. He didn't. Listen, can't nobody else do it but him. He's the only one that can do it. And so he talks to him a little bit about the Father. But if you will, skip down, if you will, to verse number 19. Look at verse number 19. Now he's talking to them about something that is totally foreign to them. He's talking about the spirit of truth. Well, they don't really know much about the Holy Spirit. And so that's not an experience they've had. That's not a, a uh, if you will, that's not a, uh, you know, a, a relationship that they've had. They've had Christ himself. Notice, if you will, He said in verse 18, he wasn't going to leave them without a comforter. He's about to leave, yes. But he said, I'm not leaving you without anything. I'm not leaving you in a lurch. I'm not leaving you on your own. But you'll notice verse number 19, he said, yet a little while. What does he mean by that? Yet a little while. Does he mean as long as the world's been waiting on him to come back? 2,000 years? Surely not. Some would say, well, the scripture said, Peter said that a thousand years was as a day and a day was as a thousand years with the Lord. So it's just been two days. That's not what he's talking about. Notice he said just a little while. Keep in mind, he's not talking, listen, he's not preaching like he was a sermon on the mount here. He's having a private conversation with his disciples. He said, yet a little while and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me because I live Ye shall live also. Who did he come back? When he he arose from the grave, did he come back and show himself to Caesar? 
Did he come back and find, listen, the square of the city and start showing himself off to everybody? Did he show himself off to the high priest and the Jewish council that was instrumental in crucifying him? Did he come back and wind up in the praetorium uh, there where Pilate sentenced him to death? Did he come back and show himself to those people? No, he did not. He showed himself to who? To his disciples, to the people that had been with him. Mary herself, Mary Magdalene, had been involved in his ministry for well over two years. And so that's who he showed himself to. And so notice verse 20, he said, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. In other words, you're going to have a revelation when that day comes, if you will, verse 27. Look at verse 27. Christ is saying to them here, Peace I leave with you. Now he's going to tell them how this will work. And so notice he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Now, what was it about Christ that was so peaceful? He knew according to Hebrews chapter number 12, the Bible said that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. It brought him great joy as God to know that he could deliver mankind back to God, redeem them, buy them back to himself, Listen, I can tell you if you're here lost this morning or you're watching and you're not saved, I can tell you if you would come to Christ that he would cancel all your sins, that he would cleanse you of all your sins, that he would take away all your sins if you just come to Christ. That's not a lie. That is true, but that's not exactly accurate. He's already canceled your sins. He's already taken away your sin. He's already cleansed you of your sin. What you've got to do is accept it. He's already done it. It's already done. Every person screaming in hell this morning has had their sins forgiven. Every person that has gone beyond the pale, every person that is facing eternal judgment today, that's part of, I believe, their, their doom today, knowing that they did not have to be there. Their sins have been forgiven too. Everybody in torment, their sins have been forgiven. He, he's took care of it already. And so you'll notice, verse 28, or let me finish up 27. He said, my peace I give to you, not as the world giveth. In other words, you're not going to be comforted by what you see. He said, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled. There he is again from verse 1. Neither let it be afraid. They had plenty of reasons to fear. If they had came and got Christ and was going to crucify him, why not them? But he's telling them, trust me. Trust me. Believe me. Get what I've been preaching to you. Get what I've been teaching you. Notice verse number 28. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. Look at what he said. I go away and come again unto who? Unto you. Who's he talking to? The disciples, thank you. I've got eight people on this side and about five on this side. Hallelujah. I'm kidding. Yes. Yes, he's talking to the disciples. He's saying, I'm going away, but I'm coming back to you. Is he talking about his second coming here? Sure don't sound like it, does it? I'm going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice. In other words, that word loving him, in other words, if you had loved me enough to listen to me, you loved me enough to listen to me, it's been said a good marriage is perfected by how much each other, how much they listen to each other. If you love me enough to listen to me, if you love me enough to pay attention to me, if you love me enough to hear what I've been saying to you, he said, you're going to rejoice because you're going to see all of the plan of salvation coming together. If you just would get it, he said, because I said I go unto the Father. Where's he going? Unto the Father. Who could go into the holies of holies, by the way? Could just anybody? The priest. And what did the Bible tell us about Christ? He is our what? High priest after what? The order of Melchizedek. In other words, he's an eternal high priest. 
The Bible tells us that we can come to him, the book of Hebrews chapter number 4, we can come to him with our off infirmities or our troubles, our problems. We can come to him with those things. Why? Because he ever lives to make intercession for us. Why? Because we can find mercy and help in time of need. Why? Because he's our high priest that can be touched with the very things that you and I go through. In other words, he's the God-man. He was God that became a man. They can deal with everything people deal with. And so he's telling them here, he's going to his father, and his father is greater than him. Verse 29, and now I have told you, before it come to pass, I'm trying to tell you what's going to happen here. I'm trying to let you know how all this is going to play out. I'm trying to tell you what it's all for. I'm trying to get it through your mind. What's happening? Notice, he said, And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it come to pass, you might believe. Verse number 30 reflects on his arrest and his trial. Notice he said, You better listen to me because I'm not going to have a chance to do this after now. Notice verse number 30, Hereafter, after now. He said, I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. One of our songs this morning that, uh, that our choir sung was talking about how devil thought he'd won the battle. <laughs> no, no, no. He's saying this. He's saying the prince of this world, it's going to seem like the devil's in charge. It's going to seem like all is lost. It's going to seem like everything has failed. It's going to seem like you have nothing else now to place your faith on and everything that you have poured your heart and life into for three and a half years is all for nothing. That's what he's saying. He said, I can't talk with you about it after now. We'll be able to have this conversation after now. Keep in mind, who's he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. So we can't do it after now. And so, notice in chapter 15, and I won't read this to you, but in chapter 15, he talks about being the vine, them being the branches. He tells them to do what? He tells them to abide in him. In other words, stick with me now. Stick with me. Keep in mind what I've been saying to you. Hope I'm not losing you this morning. Stick with me. That's what he's telling them. And he sums it up in verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. Notice those verses, these things have I spoken unto you that you may, uh, that, that my joy, my joy, in other words, he knows why he's doing it. Yes, the human side of him dreaded it. He asked, he said in Gethsemane, with, with the capillaries breaking in his, in his face and the blood mixing with his sweat and that stress, he asked the Lord, he said, he asked his father, he said, if there's some other way, he said, we'll do it another way. He said, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. In other words, if there is no other way, there was no other way. And so he said, let it be done the way you, you have planned it. Let it be done. Oh, yes, he dreaded that pain. Listen, just he didn't go into God mode where he didn't feel anything. No, no, no. He didn't do that, friend. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's confirmation. He felt the nails. He felt the scourging. He felt the shame. He felt it all. And so he's saying here, these things have I spoken unto you. What did he say? Stay with me. Abide in me. Stay with me. He said, I'm telling you this so you'll have joy because there's joy sustaining me. You'll, you'll have, you'll have a, you know, some insight here. You'll, you'll understand. Even though it looks awful, it seems terrible. He said, and, my, and that joy will remain in you. You'll see it all the way through. How many knows today when you believe in something and you're happy about it? How many knows, friend, when you truly believe in it to the point to where you can be excited about it. It brings you great pleasure and blessing to see it happening and to see it working and to see it coming to pass. How many knows you don't have no trouble staying with it? So that's what he's telling his disciples. Stay with it. This is my commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. You're going to need each other. We need each other. Do you agree? You're going to need each other. And notice verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that he what? Lay down his life for his friends. 
He's about to do that. This is about to be what he's going to do. These disciples hadn't even seen it yet. He's already told them over and over. But they haven't quite got there. Even some of them rebuked him. Peter rebuked him. Oh, okay, how to you? He said, you're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. In other words, you want to prove allegiance to me? You want to prove that you're really trusting me? You want to prove that you've got a heart for me? You want to prove that all of this investment you've made in walking with me is not for nothing? He said, then do what I'm telling you. Do what I'm telling you. i tell you something today. I'm going to go way out on a limb and say if anybody here, anybody watching, myself included, if there's ever been times that we've been disappointed in Christ, disillusioned in faith, if we've ever been discouraged with Scripture, listen, you can chalk that up to us, just not really following what Jesus said. Amen? If you will, chapter 16. Over there, real quickly, chapter 16. This conversation continues. We'll be done shortly, about another 45 minutes. I'm kidding. But we'll be done shortly. Notice chapter 16. Notice in verse number 5. He said here, but now, when? Now, but now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask me, whither goest thou? In other words, he's blown them away with all this information. You're not asking me about this. They needed to understand this, but they're not asking him. Because I've said these things to you, you've gotten sad. You've gotten your sorrows filled your heart. Well, I'll tell you, when things get out of our control, we do get sad about it, don't we, at times? And you're sad about this. And notice verse 7. He's telling them, he's te- he's telling them I'm telling you the truth. <clears throat> notice... <clears throat> Notice, he's talking again about the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. Notice in verse number 8 down through 11, he's talking about what's going to happen when he's died on the cross, when he takes his blood to the mercy seat. He's talking about the things that will happen. The world will be reproved of sin. In other words, he's destroyed sin. And that's the great sin of the world they didn't believe in, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more because he went to his Father, because he personally presented his blood at the mercy seat. Everyone can be righteous. That will come to him. And then of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. In other words, he now, after this all takes place, he will have complete, absolute victory. And so you'll notice, if you will, down in verse number 16, a little while, and ye shall not see me. What? A little while. Not thousands of years, but a little while. How long was a little while? Three days. A little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. Is this starting to make sense why this is written this way? He's talking to his disciples. He's letting them know what's going to happen. Notice he said, because the reason you're not going to see me is because I go to the Father. Well, verses 17 and 18, we can see his disciples. Boy, they're really getting it, aren't they? They're saying, what is he talking about? What? What is this? What does this mean? Verse number 19, he's asking them, do you want me to tell you what I'm talking about? Verse number 20, truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. Is that the second coming? No. The Bible said at the second coming the world would weep and lament. They would cry for the rocks and mountains to fall upon them. They would know they're out of time. Judgment has fallen. The Christ has returned. That's not, that's not what he's talking about in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 1 verse 9. That's not what he's talking about. Where they said this same Jesus that you've seen ascended will uh, likewise descend or return that way. That's not what he's talking about. Matter of fact, at the second coming of Christ, listen, they will be no non-believers. Even the atheists will believe at the second coming of Christ. There will be no non-believers there. He's not talking about, he's not even describing that. Notice he said, you're going to weep. Your hearts are going to be broken, but the world is going to rejoice. Ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow 
shall be turned into joy. When's that going to happen? Let's look. He said, gives, a, gives a, an example of a birth in verse number 21. Then verse number 22. He said, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. What? I will see who again? You again. Now we can take this and say he'll see us again. Well, yes, he will. But we're not who he's talking to here. Not directly. He's telling them, I'm going to see you, you, again. These disciples, I'm going to see you again. Notice he said, but I will see you again and your heart shall rejoice. And your joy no man takes from you. I'll tell you when he, listen, when Christ arose from the dead and these disciples came witnesses of that, all of them but John was killed for that very testimony. All of them but John. John died of old age. It was said that Jewish tradition says they tried to bowl him and hold and kill him, but hold and bowl. Listen, they were all killed for this truth. In other words, they got laser focused, didn't they? Peter the denier became Peter the evangelist. Paul the injurer became Paul the, listen, Paul the evangelist. I'm here to tell you, listen, friend, it became apparently clear. Why? Because they saw him in his resurrected state. If you will, look at, look at what he said. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you whatsoever. Ye, ye shall ask the Father in my name. He will give it you. And he's telling them, he said, you haven't asked for anything. But talk to me about this. Prepare yourself. In the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he try to get them to do? Pray. Where they wouldn't what? Fall into temptation. Yes, if you will, John chapter number 20. Let's turn there real quickly. John chapter number 20, or you don't have to turn. Nathan will show it to you. John chapter 20, verse number 11. Well, what's happened here? The disciples have come, and if you will, uh, look at verse number, verse, number, uh, verse number 9. For as yet they knew not. Who are they talking about here? Peter and John, two of the top apostles. For as yet they knew not that the scripture that he must rise from the dead. That word knew is an intimate word. In other words, they haven't taken it to heart yet. <laughs> He's told them over and over and over and over. He's had this whole conversation that you and I have analyzed, but they still hadn't got it. <laughs> but if you'll notice verse number 11, but Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had laid. What is that a picture of? One at the head, one at the feet is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. What is in the middle of the two angels on the Ark, on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant? Didn't you ever watch Raiders of the Lost Ark? What's in that? What's on each end of that? The mercy seat. That's what's in the middle is the mercy seat. And so notice... Verse 13, and they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they've laid him. And when she had said thus, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now keep in mind, she was part of his ministry herself for over two years, but she does not recognize him, and she doesn't recognize his voice at first either. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener. Now get that, and get that in your mind. The Bible tells us, and I didn't give this verse to Nathan, but the Bible tells us in chapter number 5 of 2 Corinthians, verse number 21, that he, knew, that he that knew no sin became sin for us. He was not in shining, gleaming white garments here. She thought he was a gardener. How many of you go out and do your gardening in a white shirt? Those of you who've had these lawn businesses, and we've got some folks in here that's had some of them, how many of you wore a white tux to do all that in? No, when you're doing gardening, you get a little dirty, don't you? You're doing gardening, you get that soil on you. You get that, you know, that, that dirt on you. And you do that. She thought that's who he was. She thought he was a gardener. Notice, she thought he was a gardener and saith unto him, Sir, 
If thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Now she knows him. Now she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not. Notice that. In other words, don't cling to me. Touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my Father. When's he going? I've not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. He has arisen from the grave early that morning, but he's about to go present his blood, listen, to God the Father. He's about to go prepare the place he told his disciples that he was going to prepare for them where they could be with him. He's about to make it possible for everybody who ever trusted in him to be in the very presence of God the Father before he presents his own blood. Remember, the priest had to do this. Before he presents his own blood, this is not possible. And so that's where he's going. He's ascending to his Father that very day of resurrection, if you will. Notice that in verse number 19, that same day at evening, he's back. Notice this, being the first day of the week, same day, notice that. He said the doors were shut. When, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. What did he tell them he was leaving with them? His peace. What's the first thing he mentions? Peace be unto you. How in the world could they have this peace? They had to stay focused. And so you'll notice that not only this, I won't read it to you, but he encourages them to touch him. He, a matter, matter of fact, other gospels tell us that he even ate something with them. He encourages them to handle him. He encourages them to look at him. Why? Because he's returned from the Father. He has went ahead and made the atonement, the blood atonement, in the very presence of Almighty God himself. He has made that place possible and made that position possible for you and I now to be exactly where the Father is, just like he is. This is not when he became our advocate. The Bible tells us very plainly where is he after he ascended. Acts chapter 1 verse 9, they watched him leave. Where did he go? The scripture said he went to the right hand of the Father. But on the day of resurrection, he went and presented his blood. Now you study it for yourself. He went and presented his blood. And if you will, in this particular passage, uh, he has uh, listened letting his disciples know that all this has truly been finished and just as a footnote, just so you'll have this to kind of chew on and think about what was happening while he was in the tomb. Let me just give you a quick overview of that, but we won't spend much time on it. What was he doing while he was in the tomb? Okay, according to the scripture, Luke 23, 43, and Jesus said unto him, the repentant thief, verily and truly I say unto thee, today, when? Today. Today thou shalt be with me where? In paradise, where was paradise? Luke chapter 16, verse 26. The rich man, the Bible said, lifted up his eyes in hell. He looks across a great divide and he sees Abraham over there in another place. And you'll notice he said, and besides all these things between us and you, there is a great gulf fix so that they which would pass uh, from hence or from here to you cannot, neither can they pass from you to us. They can't do it either. There was a great expanse, but it was in the same region. That place called Abraham's bosom, paradise. In Ephesians chapter number 4, verses 8 through 10, let me read that to you real quickly. It says this, that he that ascended first descended. Look at this. He said, <clears throat> he said in verse 8, he said, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Who is captivity? The Old Testament saints, they died in faith, keeping the law, honoring God, but nobody can go into God's presence without the blood applied. Do you hear me? Nobody. What did Christ do? He goes down there where he told the thief he was going with him. What did he do? He said, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. 
that was gifts that they didn't exactly know about. He said, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Did it stop there? No, not exactly. In Revelation chapter number 1 verse 8, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and of hell. In other words, listen, he's taken any authority and dominion Satan had away from that. You say, well, what about what happened to all those people that was down there waiting in that place of paradise. So let me tell you what happened to them according to the scripture. Matthew 27, 52 through 53. Let me turn over there. Read that to you real quickly. Matthew 57, 52 through 27 rather, 52 through 53. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. You say, well, how come they didn't stay here on earth? They couldn't. They had a place to go. They graduated. Where did they graduate to? 2 Corinthians chapter number, of, chapter number 5 verse 8 says this, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. They're present with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 12 verses 1 through 3. Let me read that to you real quickly. How many is bored to tears with this stuff? Don't worry, I'm about done. Listen to what he said. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. In other words, he, can't, he said, I can't tell you if I was really there. It was a vision. He said, caught up, such and one caught up to where? The third heaven. He said, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise that has moved, that has been taken up with Christ. He made that way, like he told his disciples, he made it possible. And so listen to what else he said. He said, of such an one I will glory, yet not of myself. <laughs> Look at this. He said, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. And by the way, hell made use. Hell made use of the space that paradise vacated. Listen to Isaiah chapter number, uh, chapter number five. And let's see what it is. Chapter number five, <clears throat> and verse chapter number. Yes, that's right. Chapter number five, verse number fourteen. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp. And he hath rejoiced, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. In other words, it took that area. It took that over. And I know what you're thinking. Man, you're far-fetched with all of this. Well, let me give you one last thing to chew on this morning. The Scripture tells us that Christ did deliver these people. Listen to what Daniel had to say about it. In Daniel chapter number, and he says a lot more of this, but I'm not going to give you all of it. I don't want to confuse you. Daniel 7 verse 13, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. There is isn't but one. There is isn't but one. He's talking about Christ. One like the Son of Man with the clouds of heaven. What's he talking about? The clouds of heaven. Hebrews chapter number 12 tells us what? That we, have, we are surrounded by what? Such a great cloud of witnesses. What's he talking about? He's talking about the people in chapter 12. In the Hall of Fame chapter. Those cloud of witnesses. Christ is coming bringing these people with him. When did he do that? When he, listen, went down, preached grace to them, delivered them. Notice he said, The clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, God the Father. And they brought him near before him. You go back, like I said, Hebrews 12 and 1. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nation and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom which shall not be destroyed. Can I tell you today, Christ's kingdom is intact. He's not talking about a future event here. He's talking about when he arose 
When he presented his own blood to God the Father, the mercy seat. When he came back and fit, listen, and salvation, redemption was absolutely finished. Can I tell you today, in Christ, Satan has no more dominion over you. He does not. All he has is deception. If you give him any place in your life, if you're saved, it's because you gave it to him. He has no power to take it. I'm giving you a whole lot to think about today, but I hope this has been important enough to somebody that they'll go read this, that they'll go study this, that they'll go look at this, that they'll research this, because it's good to know something about Jesus. Amen? It's good to know what, re what listen, what Resurrection Day is all about. It's good to know that it's more. We'll enjoy hunting some eggs with the great grands after a while, but it's good to know it's more than that. It's always good to see you in your Easter best. I'm always blessed to see you, but it goes further than that. It's good, friend, to know that it is done. He has finished it. It is completed, and you and I got it in Jesus. So we'll ask for an invitation this morning, and can I say, he has already, he has already, Listen, remitted our sins. The scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 that you and I have been made ambassadors for him. In other words, he's given us this good news to share with people. He's given us these scriptures that we might prove it to people. Oh, friend, listen. Some thinks it's about keeping a bunch of rules, trying to somehow or another, you know, appease God. Well, I tell you what, the good news is God's already appeased. The good news is, friend, he is satisfied in Jesus. There is not one thing that Christ failed in. There's not one thing that you and I now don't have. Listen, not only are we born again in him, but we've been positionally placed in him through adoption, if you will. I mean, he came and adopted us into himself, made it possible, given you and I the rights, all the rights, Listen, that he had promised for those who would trust him. I'm glad to know him, aren't you? I'm glad that our lives has purpose. And I'm glad he's given us a place. And today as you bow your head with me for a moment, can you not just take a moment today and say thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to celebrate this resurrection day. Thank you, Lord, that you have cleansed me from all of my sin and you don't remember them anymore. Thank you, Father, that they are gone. They are no longer held against me. Thank you, Lord, that you have given me a clear opportunity uh, to come to you at any time, any moment, anywhere, about anything. Thank you, Lord, that you have, have made it possible for me, little old me. I may not have access to the White House. I may not have access to the governor's mansion. I may not can show up at some capital around the world and just walk in. But you have given little old me access to the throne room of Almighty God. I can know you on a very personal basis. And you might be here this morning and say, I really don't know the Lord. I really never cared too much about knowing the Lord. I'm only here today because my family made me come. I'm only here today because it seemed like the thing to do. It's Easter. And so all the rest of the time, I'm not going to worry about this. I'm not going to be a bit concerned about this, and this isn't going to matter. Can I tell you today, even with that attitude, you matter to him. Even with that attitude, he loves you. And friend, can I say today, listen, what we've talked about today just proves to us how serious he was about making all these things possible. He let these defiant disciples because they kept rejecting his, him telling them what was going to happen. They'd know they didn't want to be away from him. They didn't want anything to change. They didn't want to have to go through this difficulty. They didn't want to have to deal with this. They wanted everything to be just great and the kingdom to be ushered in. They didn't want it that way. But even though they were so defiant and did not listen, he went ahead and he pressed on and he made it possible. He did prepare a place for them. He did make it possible for all of those as he prayed in John 17 that would believe because of their message to be able to follow him as well. Today, he loves you. And I hope you go away from here with that message as we all stand.
you've got a need this morning, I'd love to ask you today to share it with the Lord. Because he'd love to help you today.